The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. She makes me lie down in green meadows. Beside the water she will lead. She restores my soul. She rides my wrongs. She leads me in the path of good things and fills my heart with songs. Even though I walk through a dark and dreary land, there is nothing that can shake me she has said she won't forsake me, I'm in her hand. She sets a table before me in the presence of my foes. She anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely, surely goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will live in her house forever, forever and ever. Glory be to our mother, and daughter, and to the Holy of Holies. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. <clears throat> All right, and now, we will turn it over to Reverend Savannah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Good morning, good morning. So before I begin, I would love it if you would all turn your cameras back on so I can see your beautiful faces. It helps for us to feel like we're connected. If you feel comfortable, turn on your video for a second. As Luke and um, Omega were singing, I started to get a little emotional because um, I know so many of you <laughs> and it's, it's like a homecoming. Uh, the 10 minutes before we started this, we were all chatting and it's almost like this homecoming where uh, we all get to greet and see one another. It's so good to see you. Let me move my screen over here so I can see more of you. Awesome. John, you're not upside down anymore. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, you can turn them off now. I just wanted to say hello. And I see my mom. Oh my gosh. My mom pops up and surprises me every time. <laughs> so great. So um, I'm joining you this morning uh, from in rainy Seattle. <laughs> it has been so beautiful and sunny here. And then of course the rain came. And uh, for all of you who are joining for the first time, welcome. Uh, this is a really beautiful community uh, that I call, still call my home. Um, and uh, I'm excited to give the message for you this morning. So let us, let us just take a deep breath together. I know I could use a deep breath, just a deep cleansing breath, that holy breath. Hmm. Hmm. The topic um, that I chose this morning is called, uh, We Were Made for These Times. And in preparation for this, I was thinking, my gosh, it's already July. It is halfway through the year. It's hard to believe that we are already here. And I've been thinking to myself, you know, could I just do a 2020 do-over? Could I just, could we all just have a do-over? And I think that we will look back uh, on this year and we will ask ourselves what we were to learn and understand 
about ourselves as we navigated so much uncertainty and fear and chaos. And the irony about this moment, about this time, is that there's this illusion of control. There's this thinking that we knew the plan or we could control the boxes that we've created to keep ourselves safe and to maintain some uh, form of normalcy. But what we can absolutely know for sure is that nothing in life is certain. Uh, however, first cause, God, life, infinite life, this intelligence, this endless supply that I know and call love is the activity that is happening all the time. And so I've been thinking to myself, uh, what are some things that I'm learning? What are some things that I can absolutely know for sure? And the first one is, we were made for these times. Something is collectively happening on the planet and we are being called to shift consciousness. You will notice that systems and structures are collapsing that do not support the whole. To have a vision of a world that works for everyone, for all, we have to consider, as we're getting the opportunity to consider even more so now, the all. What is not working? And so we get to rise to this occasion. And, and I believe that we have the tools, the technology, the brain, and the heart power to change everything right now. Dr. Clarissa Pinkola is an American poet. She's a Jungian uh, psychoanalyst and a post-trauma recovery specialist. She's also the author of Women Who Run With the Wolves, which is a beautiful book, uh, and also a spoken word artist. She grew up in the now vanished oral tradition of her immigrant refugee families who could not read nor write or did so haltingly and for whom English was their third language overlying their, their ancient natal languages. And she wrote this piece many years ago and it was originally entitled Letter to a Young Activist During Troubled Times with the subtitle do not lose heart, we were made for these times. And then it was adapted and uh, the title then became, we were made for these times. So I want to read a little bit of this to you and, and ask you to just take it into your, your contemplation, into a prayerful moment. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or keep them you know, softly open. She says, my friends, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. I have heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. You were right in your assessments. The luster and hubris some have aspired to while endorsing acts so heinous against children, elders, everyday people, the poor, the unguarded, the helpless, is breathtaking. Yet I urge you, I ask you, gentle you, to please not spend your spirit dry by bewailing these difficult times. Especially do not lose hope. Most particularly because the fact is that we were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I grew up on the Great Lakes and recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. Regarding awakened souls, there have never been more able vessels in the waters than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. Look out over the prow. There are millions of boats of righteous souls on the waters with you. Even though your veneers may shiver from every wave in this stormy royal, I assure you that the long timbers composing your prow and rudder come from a greater forest. That long grained lumber is known to withstand storms, to hold together, to hold its own and to advance regardless. In any dark time, there is a tendency to veer toward fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in the world. Do not focus on that. There is a tendency, too, to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach, by what cannot yet be. 
do not focus there. That is spending the wind without raising the sails. We are needed. That is all we can know. And though we meet resistance, we more so will meet great souls who will hail us, love us, and guide us, and we will know them when they appear. Didn't you say you were a believer? Didn't you say you pledged to listen to a voice greater? Didn't you ask for grace? Don't you remember that to be in grace means to submit to the voice greater? Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is an accumulation of acts, adding, adding to, adding more, continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small, determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like dark in dark times, like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks, can send up flares, build signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire. To display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy towards others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things you can do. So I will get back to this reading in just a moment. But what I love about this writing, when I read it, I cried and I read it thinking, oh my gosh, she wrote it so many years ago, but it is so poignant for our time now. And, and some of the messages that I think we can take from this. And the first one is, she keeps saying, do not focus there. The power of our attention is so vital right now in keeping ourselves sane and centered, calm, and on the world that we desire to create. We teach this in the science of mind philosophy that what we focus on, we create. What we uh, intend and believe, what we are co-creating, where we put our attention and our energy expands and grows. And so the question we get to ask ourselves is, is my focus on the things that bring me joy, that bring me alive? Or is my focus solely on the problem and the struggle? She also says, we are needed, that there is no time to waste. I don't know about you, but time seems to be speeding up. It feels like, as I said, we're halfway through 2020. And more importantly, as a time as this, that there is no time to waste in looking to the world or to others to fill us up, to validate our experiences, to give us what we think that we need. Do not betray ourselves and do not betray yourself is the message I'm getting. We can use this time to fill ourselves up with the things that we love, the purpose we are called to be about, the divine calling that is nudging and pulling us forward. The challenge I find with uncertainty and fears is that, that, that all of that brings up or the fears and the uncertainty is that we often go looking for our wholeness and our peace outside out there. We go looking for that thing to give us certainty. I know at the beginning of COVID, I remember feeling so isolated up here because I had just moved and I had friends here, but everyone was so isolated and to themselves that it really forced me to go inward. And it forced a lot of us to, to, to go internal. And I remember thinking to myself, I need some sense of normalcy and certainty. So I just got in my car and drove half an hour away to a beach. And just the sense of driving gave me the sense of control over something. But what I noticed that happens in our seeking for uh, validation and external uh, power and control is that we tend to, in turn, abandon ourselves. And so, I hope that these questions uh, provide some insight and 
some helpful um, navigation for you throughout whatever process you're going through. These are some questions I've been asking myself. At what point did you abandon yourself to keep the connection in a relationship of someone who was not worthy of you? At what point did you abandon yourself and your values to appease your family? At what point did you abandon yourself to be liked as the nice guy or the nice girl? At what point did you abandon yourself for someone else's dreams or expectations of you? At what point did you abandon your dream and your career you wanted to fill the status quo? These behaviors, they point to the ability for us to choose ourselves first and to see how out of alignment or the contrast uh, where we are with truly knowing ourselves. It calls us, I think, back to gentleness, to self-inquiry, to a deeper care and love for ourselves. Another thing that I've been learning is uh, the power of this moment. Can I live in the power of this moment? What I notice is that so many of our fears and the need to get our needs met somewhere else other than right here is based strictly on the past of what was, of the event that happened, of what happened, of what I didn't get. And the, the fears that we experience now, the struggle is actually a narrative and a story of the past or the future. It is not about this moment. So when we are in the now moment, we are at choice. When we release these old stories and these old tapes, which I know is not easy to do because that's usually what is operating, we can make a new decision, a brave decision, a courageous decision to accept a new pattern and a new reality. And really, it is the only place of power to choose from is right now. That now moment is what shapes the future moments. Another thing I've been learning is uh, what if what I'm letting go of is actually something in there for me to gain? What if in the letting go there is something to gain? I think, again, the fear of letting go is rooted in this belief that what is on the other side of letting go is somehow not better. That, that on the other side of letting go, that thing or that experience is somehow not good for us. That is the limiting belief. The fear of letting go is that we will be thrown out of control or, or things might not be safe or I might not find something better. But what if it is? What if on the other side of letting go is this amazing opportunity and career? What if it is an incredible partnership? What if it is a life worth showing up to where you are feeling completely whole and alive and inspired? When we are right at the edge of a decision, about to take a leap into the unknown, we know this by being right on the edge, we have to trust that there is something greater on the other side. That, that is, um, uh, what happened when I moved my life here. When I moved to Seattle, I followed this vision. It was a feeling, it was an intuitive nudge. And despite uh, what others might have said to me, the same thing I know happened to me years ago, seven years ago now, when I decided to move into the middle of a war zone in a revolution in Egypt, it happened the same way. Everyone said, you are crazy, what are you thinking? And there was that intuitive hit, there was that nudge that said, you have to do this. And what I gained from that was so much freedom and rich learning and wisdom. And so I ask you to think to yourself, if you can trust enough to stand on the edge of the unknown and allow life to shape your experience, knowing that it's for you, that it's good. Brene Brown, as many of you know, is one of my favorite researchers and authors. And she says this, she says, daring leaders are never silent about hard things. I know that Oakland's community uh, has been participating so much and it's been amazing to watch uh, the involvement that you all have had in um, the, the most recent uh, protests in social justice and activism and all of the, the different ways in which we are as white folks, you know, stepping up and taking a look, taking an honest look at ourselves and um, all of the ways that we are honoring uh, Black voices and the history 
of uh, many black uh, congregants in our community. Um, I think it's such a beautiful thing and it, is, it has been a progression, right? It has been an evolution. And in my own process of all of this, being in a predominantly white community up here in Seattle, I have had my own interesting growing edges. And so that statement, daring leaders are never silent about hard things, is so relevant and prevalent for us right now. This is our work to do. It is to lean into those vulnerable edges and to trust, again, that our consciousness is being shaped by our willingness to see ourselves, to have moral courage, and to do some work. It's, that is what daring to lead is about. And so to summarize uh, these things, we were made for these times and there is no time for us to waste. waste. Um, it is important that we think about where our focus and our intention is uh, in our lives right now, how much attention and energy we spend on what it is that brings us alive as opposed to our struggles. And, um, and, and also coming back to the power of this moment and pulling our attention when we start to worry and we start to uh, find ourselves in anxiety or turmoil, recognizing that all of that narrative and that story is actually not something that we're experiencing in the now moment. It is attached to something from the past or fear of the future. So I want to uh, close here with the end of Clarissa's reading. She ends her piece by saying this. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this. In my uttermost bones, I know something as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, who you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. In that spirit, I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. So let us now turn within for a prayer. Just taking that holy breath in. Connecting to our heart space, to that infinite intelligence and wisdom that lives within each and every one of us. I turn within for a prayerful moment to re-remember who and whose I am. A divine expression of this one life, this one power, this infinite intelligence that is orchestrating everything that is happening right here on this planet and beyond. It is a presence of love and beauty and joy and opportunity of clarity and wholeness. It is absolute perfection. And as I know this is true about my life, I know this to be true about each and every one of us on this call, that we are all divine expressions of this one power and presence. It is fueling us, it is funding us with the resources, the tools, the insight, the ahas that are needed for us to move about and be about our purpose and what we're here to do at this time in our human history. Releasing any negativity or toxic thoughts, releasing any anxiety or judgment that we might have about this or that, I absolutely call in divine right action for each and every one of us, knowing that we are guided and guarded and protected as we navigate this uncertain life that we live in. Coming back to the truth and the awareness of the oneness that exists in this world, that each one of us in our own unique way play a part in the tapestry of this beauty and the unfoldment of consciousness as it is portrayed right now in the world of effect. And so I bless everyone everywhere. I bless all walks of life. I bless our youth. Uh, I bless all the work that is being done in our spiritual communities to uplift and to inspire and to support a world that truly works for all people everywhere. And so if there is anyone in your life or if you are seeking a little bit more joy or love or harmony or order, whatever it may be, let us just take a moment to bring in their names, 
of those people into our consciousness right here and now. And I bless everyone on our prayer list. I bless our planet and our mindful stewardship of her. And I know that we are truly here to be about the good and the love and the joy that I absolutely believe exists for each and every one of us. And so with this prayer and this affirmation, I know that all is truly well. And together let us say, Ashe, and so it is. <laughs>